Dr. Mark Comrade. I'm a psychiatrist. I practice in Baltimore. I'm on the faculty of Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland. Uh, and I'm also the ethicist for the Shepherd Pratt Health System, which is the largest not-for-profit psychiatric care system uh, in the Maryland and uh, surrounding areas. I have discovered that since around 2002 that uh, there not only has been a vigorous program of medical euthanasia that's been going on in Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands, but more specifically that that program opened to uh, eligibility for certain psychiatric patients who met the criteria of having conditions that the patients themselves considered insufferable. Uh, and uh, that were considered untreatable. Although untreatable is not just defined by the medical team, it's also defined by the patient because the patient retains the already established right to refuse certain treatments. So even though there may be treatments that could be helpful, if the patient doesn't wish those treatments, then de facto that becomes an untreatable situation. So around the year 2002, those countries removed the distinctions between terminal and non-terminal illnesses and the distinctions between physical suffering and psychological suffering in terms of criteria for eligibility for physician-assisted suicide and for medical euthanasia. And in those countries, that's primarily the method, is the doctor actually starts an injection and literally kills the patient. It's not like in America where the method is you write a prescription uh, and the patient takes that prescription at the time and place of their own choosing because of the opening to non-terminally ill people with psychological suffering, uh, psychiatric patients began to get in line. Uh, and now there are over 100 psychiatric-only situations, patients with just chronic mental illness, who meet the criteria and are euthanized on request uh, often by the very same psychiatrists who had been previously trying to prevent their suicide. So I discovered that in fact uh, psychiatric patients, uh, rather some of them, uh, rather than having their suicides prevented, were actually having their suicides administered by physicians, by psychiatrists. So, my own point of departure in understanding and trying to grapple with that is in a venerable tradition of ethics. We're here at the ANSCOM Center, which has a venerable uh, tradition of moral thinking uh, that has been developed uh, systematically and non-systematically over the course of millennia in the Catholic tradition. Uh, I am tapping into, historically, in a way, an even older tradition, which is the tradition of medical ethics. Uh, which I would call the Hippocratic tradition of medical ethics that dates back to uh, 300 years uh, before Christ. Uh, and really, the origins of medicine in that tradition have, throughout the millennia, really included a, a very coherent set of values. And one of those core values, value that has been there since our origin, is the value of not killing. As a matter of fact, the Hippocratic Oath, uh, something that doctors have taken for millennia, says, I will not administer a man a poison, nor will I advise anybody else to do so. And that actually was one of the definitional features that separated the cult of Hippocrates from other Asclepian cults at the time in ancient Greece. Uh, and in fact, it was very core and definitional. You had to actually profess, which is where the word profession comes from, a set of values, and that was one of the key fundamental values that has continued to characterize the house of medicine. It was from those origins that the mighty tree of medicine has grown, much in the same way that Christianity grew its mighty tree from the original cult of Jesus Christ. There were many other uh, messianic cults at that time, and that seemed to be uh, the one that uh, had traction and survived and suffused the values of the church over the next 2,000 years, much as 
the values of medicine have grown from those origins. So my own concerns about allowing doctors to kill patients rose out of that. But more specifically, my concerns as a psychiatrist involving psychiatric patients is that I see that the core mission of psychiatry, the core values of psychiatry, are actually to help people in despair, help people with demoralization, to help people who simply cannot see their way cognitively or emotionally to a better future, helping people find a path to a better future, helping mitigate suffering as much as possible, taking the journey of suffering with them, listening to them intently, and to even, yes, we even have skills very actually similar to many of the uh, relig religious uh, clergy uh, to help people make meaning of suffering. By the way, independent of whatever the psychiatric diagnosis is, the mental health professions have that skill set and are actually devoted to trying to help suffering people to those ends uh, and to fundamentally prevent suicide. I mean, that's core to our mission with individuals. That's core to our social mission in terms of what we're trying to promulgate to society about what, uh, <laughs> what people should do who are in despair and suffering and suicidal. So to take this mission of ours and to stand it on its head and to say, yes, but for some of you, for some of you, we're actually going to take your life from you. We're going to not just give you the means for suicide, but indeed we'll even start the IV and we'll create death for you, uh, is an anathema, uh, is an inversion of the fundamental ethos of psychiatry. Of course, one of the problems in mental health is that compared to other specialties in the medical profession, our patients characteristically suffer from lack of access to resources, uh, lack of funding for resources. Uh, and as a result, uh, those things that we do have available for our patients are often not funded as well as others. For example, I had uh, one patient who I could not get funding for them to have a long-term residential treatment, which really could have turned their case around. But the patient had liver failure, and the patient was fully funded for their liver transplant, which then failed, and they got a second liver transplant. Total cost, two and a half million US dollars uh, for two successive transplants. And yet the healthcare system and the healthcare funding was unable or unwilling uh, or not designed to fund six months at what I felt would be a transformational residential treatment program. So once you begin to make euthanasia a path, an alternate path, my worry, my fear is that the, uh, the funding, the energy, uh, the enthusiasm, the attention to opening up those far too clogged channels of access to mental health care and mental health treatment, those advocacies disappear. Uh, and things get, end up getting short-circuited, not just short-circuited in the minds of policymakers and payers uh, and insurers, uh, but also get short-circuited in the minds of the treaters, the families, and the patients. Once a short circuit is established, that's where the energy tends to flow. And we know that from many other examples. And all of the work that we've been doing to try to open access to mental health care, all the work that we've been doing to try to advocate for parity, the idea that mental illness should be treated the same as physical illness, uh, all that we've been doing to try to advocate for access for our patients is threatened by this kind of short circuit. has also led to a certain kind of attitude on the general population and also among people who have chronic disabilities that designates a disabled life or a mentally ill life or a medically ill life as somehow not as worth living as it used to be. 
uh, and that, that, that already vulnerable population finds itself being recalibrated in the minds of society. So I have a colleague in Belgium whose father has a chronic condition, uh, and that uh, gentleman has chosen not to have euthanasia for it. Well, I'm told that his, uh, whenever he starts to complain about his suffering uh, and his symptoms, uh, that he's starting to get the reaction of his friends who say, you know what, you chose not to have euthanasia. So quit your belly aching. You know, you don't really have a right to complain. You know, you could have had a relief of your suffering. So the sympathy that normally people would have had, or if they lacked sympathy, they may have kept that uh, loss of sympathy to themselves. Uh, now, uh, they're actually being explicit in denouncing the person's complaints uh, and making it clear that he doesn't deserve their sympathy to the extent that maybe he used to back in the days when euthanasia was no longer an option. So I think that anecdote uh, speaks a lot about the subtle changes in the collective psyche in societies that begin to open to these things and start to accelerate down that slippery slope to the point that the train ends up going off the rails.